Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Midweek Bible Studies. Glad to have all of you here. Welcome. It's always a joy, a privilege to have you come and share in Bible studies together and get a chance to uh, teach and share and fellowship with each other. Um, it's just great to be here. Welcome. As you can see, a little different tonight. I, uh, we're not in our normal setting, uh, but wherever I am, we want to be able to provide uh, ministry and Bible studies to you. So while we are out of town, just want to be able to come in and teach tonight, would not let anything hinder the opportunity to share and to teach. So from our setting to your setting, welcome. Glad that you are here with us. I am excited about our study tonight, excited about the opportunity to get to share and to teach together. So let's jump in it as quickly as we can. Let's ask the Lord's grace and blessings on our time together that he would anoint this time of teaching and anoint this time of sharing on tonight. Father, I thank you and I honor you for your grace and goodness to us, for the overwhelming kindness you've shown us just today, forgiving us of our sins, protecting us from danger, keeping our minds regulated and making us productive. I thank you, God, for being with us. You have been with us in every experience of our day, and we know that you'll be with us now. We ask for your presence tonight, that as we are ministering and sharing, that you will literally let your spirit travel through these airwaves into the homes and listening and viewing places where we are all watching. And I pray that we will sense the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we yield now that you may have your way. Do what only you're able to do. Touch us, deliver us, heal us, inspire us, enlighten us, and change us. We'll give your name praise. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we honor you. Amen. 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 Once again, one more time, welcome to each of you. Want to just see who we have online with us tonight. And so I do want to give a big, big welcome to Jerome Harper. Uh, Jerome, uh, Brother Jerome, thank you so much for being on uh, tonight and sharing. God bless you and thank you for being here. Uh, Sister Jack A., thank you so much, Jackie, for being on tonight and sharing with us. Also, just want to recognize uh, Yolanda Fanning. Uh, thank you, Sister Yolanda, for being here, and Lilia Denard and Carlos Green. Amen, Carlos. Glad to have you here with us. Tawana Norman, uh, welcome. Glad you're here with us, Tawana. D. Lawrence, welcome, D. Lawrence. Glad you are in the room tonight. Christine Caesar, glad you're here. Ronald Gilliam, welcome. Glad to have you, Ronald. Sister Frankie Campbell, Sister Frankie, glad you're with us. Glad you're with us tonight. Welcome to Bible Studies. Uh, Sister Gina Levita Hudson, welcome, Sister Gina. Glad that you're with us tonight. And Sharice Dawkins, welcome to you. Sister Cookie, uh, glad you are here with us tonight. Marlene Pugh, so glad to have you with us. It's always a joy and an honor to have each of you here sharing with us in our time of teaching in our Bible studies. Welcome, welcome, welcome to each one of you. Well, I want to make certain that we are all here and ready to study the Word of God. I've got a few things I want to share with you guys before we jump into the scriptures tonight. Uh, excited about a few things that's happening at our church. One is for our new members. Listen carefully. If you have joined our church in any capacity, there is a special Super Saturday new members orientation class that we'd love to have you as a part of to be in. And so we encourage you to be a part of that uh, new members orientation class. It's going to be on December the 16th. That's a Saturday, 9 a.m. in the morning on December the 16th. Now, we'll get a chance to go through all three of our Discover New Life classes in one day. All three classes in one day, December the 16th, all new members. If you've joined our church, come down and you've um, responded at the end of a worship service or a sermon, or if you've joined online or if you've joined through Zoom, however you've connected with New Life, we want you in these classes. There'll be a special opportunity for those of you that are not in the building to be a part of the class. We'll be fully set up as a video conferencing center and allowing you to take the classes by Zoom. And of course, those in the room will be blessed as a result of being in the class. Do not miss it. New members, December 16th, don't miss it. Also want to mention that the last Sunday of the year is new member graduation Sunday. That's happening December the 31st, 
very last Sunday of the year, it's New Year's Eve, we're going to have a special graduation for all of our new members. And so you'll go through new members orientation on the 16th of December for Super Saturday, if you haven't already uh, taken those classes. And then you'll come together on the last Sunday of the year and we will have a large graduation for our new members. Now, if you don't live in Atlanta or if you are one of our virtual online family members, you also will be graduating as well on that day. We will have a special graduation for you. So we'll talk with you about how that's going to happen uh, as we get closer to that event. So don't miss orientation classes, Discover New Life classes, one, two, and three, one day, Super Saturday. And don't miss the graduation, of course, last Sunday of the year in this year, last Sunday of December. Now, I'm gonna talk with you about a very special project that we're doing next January. It's for all of our ministries. We're having our ministry fair, where we're going to be opening up all of the ministries of our church to members in our church to learn more about them, what the ministries do, their function when they meet, how you can get connected deeper. Many of you have joined this church, but uh, you've not plugged in yet. And it's a fairly large church. And so when you join a large church or you join a church that you're not in the same city with, it's easy for you to disconnect and kind of get lost in the midst of all of the size or the distance. Listen carefully. The best way that you mitigate that from happening is by digging deeper in ministry, serving and getting active in ministry. So we're having a special ministry fair. It's going to take place on Sunday, January the 21st, three Sundays following. So for three Sundays in January, beginning on the 21st, a special ministry fair where we're hot uh, spotlighting all of our ministries. I am strongly encouraging you to mark your calendars to either be in the building or online so that you can join ministries and get connected through that method. The best way to grow in your walk with God is to grow deeper in your connections with the community of faith. And I pray that you'll do that. All right, those are our announcements. Now it's time to give. And um, I wanna just encourage you tonight to give generously and to give faithfully to the work that God's called the church to, the works God's called uh, your, uh, your own uh, endeavors as a member of this church, uh, the work God's called you to. I want to encourage you to give faithfully tonight. We, when we give on Wednesdays, 100% of everything that we give goes directly into ministry. It all goes there. So please give generously, give faithfully, give liberally. Every time we meet, you can always give your tithes and offerings. And of course, every time we meet, you're always welcome to give to the Dream Campaign. When you give to Dream, it's super simple to do. You simply need to go to our website to give and um, click on the Giving tab in the top right-hand corner of our homepage. Or you can simply give by text by grabbing your smartphones and you can uh, text the word New Life ATL to the number 77977. You'll get a response text back, which will tell you how you can get started with giving through PushPay if you've never done it before. Stop 30 seconds to set up the first time, and then every time you give after that, it's 10 seconds. It's literally a very simple, safe, and secure way to give. And many of you send in your gifts. Thank you for that. You send in your tithes and your offerings, and I'm so grateful that you do. Um, you can send them in to the bottom, to the address that's at the bottom of your screen. However you give tonight, I pray that you will not neglect our dream campaign. God has blessed us with some very exciting new movements, and we are making decisions every day to grow and expand what we do with dream. And I am strongly encouraging you to please give faithfully, generously to that effort. And the Lord honors what we do as a church community because all of us are a part of that, contributing to it, sacrificing for it, every person to see God's dream for this community come to pass and for our church to come to pass. So I'm praying that you give faithfully tonight. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you have given us the will to give, you've given us the heart to give and the desire to give. And I pray now that as we give tonight, that you would restore back to every person giving 100-fold. Bless in so many ways beyond finances. 
touch bodies and lives and families and relationships and minds. I pray that you will bring healing to your people because we are faithful in our giving. So now we ask for your grace to be extended upon every person who is submitting an offering. And we give your name glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen again. All right, let's all of us right now take out our smartphones or your devices or however you're giving. And let's all give together as a family tonight. just that simple and it is done thank you so much let's get ready for the word of god let's get ready for the word of god we'll be right back right after this short introduction Welcome back, right in the middle of our study on the book of Revelations. Grab your Bible, please, and open them to the last book of the Bible, and let's jump in and get started with our study. Now, I want to just quickly and briefly remind you of a few of the things that we discussed on the last time together, and we said that it's really such a shame that people don't read this book and they don't dig into it because it's got so much truth, it's got so much strength and power for our Christian walk and our daily lifestyle, and many forfeit that because they don't read it. They also don't read the book because they don't understand the whole theme of the book, the whole meaning of the book. It simply means at the end of time, good wins over evil, that we as believers, we win. It's the promise of our victory at the end. All of the imps and demons that have challenged us and held us back and uh, held us under bondage and oppression for much of our life. They are defeated in the end. The Christian is victorious in the end. It reminds us of our hope, of our hope. It tells us what heaven is and it gives us the clearest picture we can of the Christ that we worship, the Jesus that we worship and how he is worshiped in heaven. We join with the heavenly host. It speaks about afterlife things. The, the, the name of what we're studying is called eschatology. Eschatology. That's a fancy word, and I apologize for not having it on the screen, but it's a very fancy word that simply means last things or end times. Last things or end times. It's a study of the end times. And this is prophecy. It's what prophecy is about. And the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy. It's a book that speaks about the end of time and that speaks about what the signs of that end are going to be. In the Old Testament, there are a lot of books of prophecy in the Old Testament. There are only two of a particular kind of prophecy, or rather only one, excuse me, of a particular kind of prophecy, and that is apocalyptic prophecy. Apocalypse, apocalypse. Now, in our terminology, when we hear and use the word apocalypse, it means in our modern vernacular, it means the destruction of all things, um, earthly doom, the end of time, the great battle or the great destruction of the human race, the apocalypse. This is the end of all things. And the Greek word for apocalypse, where we get that word from, doesn't mean this destruction, doom, and end. It actually means the unveiling or revealing. The Greek word for apocalypse is the Greek word apokalupsis. And apokalupsis means 
revealing, unveiling. It means to unveil a previously hidden or concealed thing, truth, or reality. The end of time is not about a big destruction, a big bang, and a big calamity, and you know the nuclear bomb is going to drop. That's how the world sees the end of time. For the believer, the end of time is the beginning of eternity. The end of time for the believer is the beginning of eternal life. So for us, the end of time is really the beginning of a new time. And that's what apocalypse is. This is the unveiling of the afterlife, the unveiling of glory, the unveiling of heaven, the unveiling of the end, which really is the beginning. The book of Daniel is the only apocalyptic prophecy in the Old Testament. The book of Daniel, about three, two, three Wednesdays ago, Dr. Beasley, our director of ministries, taught from the book of Daniel. He went through a specific section of that book that speaks specifically about what we're going to be covering in the book of Revelation. He's going to be joining me throughout this series periodically and kind of sharing insights about this book. He taught the book of Daniel, just a small segment of that book for a couple of Wednesdays to help be a, to help it be a precursor to what we're teaching in the book of Revelation. The book of Daniel speaks about these events of the end time. It speaks about the unveiling and revelation and revealing of the man of sin or this little horn or what we know as the beast in the, Rev the book of Revelations or the Antichrist. It talks about this setting up of the end of days, marching through all of history from the days of Daniel through successive kingdoms to rise and fall over the Roman Empire, over the Asia Minor rather, culminating in the rise of the Christian church and of course the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the millennial kingdom. The book of Daniel has this 70th week, 77s of years, this 70th week, this last week that we're not quite in yet. We've completed the 69th week at the revelation of Christ, the coming of the Messiah. And right between the 69th week and the 70th week of Daniel's 70 week prophecy that Dr. Beasley taught, right in the middle is where we are right now. We are finished with that 69th week of history, of God's prophetic history, and we're moving into that 70th week, that last seven years, 70 weeks of years, 77s, that last seven years, which would be the time of tribulation. And then the scripture says, and the end will come. Well, that sets up what we're discussing in the book of Revelation. So I want us to Open the book, chapter one, and take our time reading a few of these verses and discussing them. And so in chapter one, verse number one, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which, which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Last time together, I told you how John saw it. He's writing all that he saw. I want to zero in on two aspects of these three verses, of these two verses. The first one is in verse number one, and it says, which things must shortly come to pass. Do you see that in verse one? Which things must shortly come to pass? We talked about shortly come to pass, not as in it's going to happen in the lifetime of John who's writing it, not shortly in that context, but it means shortly coming to pass. The word for shortly here is a Greek word that means immediately. It means quick. It's a matter of time, timing, not time timing, speed. And it says when these things happen in this book, it will happen quickly. It will happen with speed. It'll happen fast is what it means. And so it's shortly coming to pass in the context of speed. We talked about this word shortly having created different approaches to how you read the book of Revelation. And we ended last time looking at four different schools of thought or four different methods of interpretation for the book. The first one is called preterist. The preterist 
view of interpreting the book of Revelation is to see all of the events as having already happened in John's lifetime. He says it shortly is coming to pass. Shortly for the preterist means it happened while John was alive or shortly after he died. So that would be in the first century. And they see all of the destruction and the uh, judgments in the book of Revelation having happened whenever Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD by Emperor, uh, by, uh, by General uh, Titus. Uh, he came and marched into, into Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem tore down the temple. Jesus predicted that this would happen. He says this temple will be left desolate and there will not be a stone left upon another in Jesus's prophecy about the end of the temple or the end of temple worship. And many believe that that was the beginning of the great tribulation, that this was a tribulation that the Bible is talking about in Revelation and it continues even to this day. And you see all the pains happening in Israel as they're still going through their tribulation. The problem is that that doesn't fit with Daniel's prophecy, nor does it fit with all of the other aspects of the book of Revelation that doesn't have a parallel in the first century leading up to the destruction of the temple. For example, there is the beast, there is the woman that rides on the beast, there is the geopolitical uh, system of Babylon, there is this world power that will be in charge of that area. None of those things have happened as of yet, didn't happen in the first century, so that's why we don't believe that these events have already passed in the first century. I think that the first century was a precursor foreshadowing what would come to pass. And so the destruction of the temple just foreshadowed the destruction of the church. The church, the religious church, not the true church, the religious church would be destroyed much like the religious temple was destroyed. It is a foreshadowing. Religion itself will have no purpose when Christ comes back except for the relationship we have with Jesus. Many people are religious but don't know Jesus. In the temple, they were Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, but they didn't know Yahweh. They didn't know God. They had a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And so the destruction of the temple was a precursor to the destruction of religion itself as God would have it. And so the second way of seeing this is through the idea of being a historicist. The historicist interprets the book of Revelation from the perspective that these things are unfolding throughout history. And so the first three chapters and then chapter four and chapters four through five and all the other, um, the four horsemen and the seven seals and all the judgments of the trumpets and the bowls and et cetera, they see this all having unveiled throughout all of time from John's writing to the very present time today. The problem there is that you can't give parallels to much of what the book of Revelation teaches in current or in uh, history in the last century or the last millennia. There hasn't been a time when a third of the earth died. There hasn't been a time when the mountains have been on fire. There hasn't been a time when you've seen this release of demons from the abyss. There hasn't been a time where you've seen the great war that will take place called Armageddon. These things hadn't happened yet, but yet many historicists believe that they're all happening as we are living our life today. And this doesn't square with what Jesus said in his own personal return. The third way of seeing this is the idealist. And the idealist sees the book of Revelation as nothing but symbols and, and figures. It just symbolizes good versus evil. These are not real events, they say. These are just metaphors, symbols. They just stand for uh, concepts and ideas, but they are not real events. Well, that's not true, because if you were to take that approach, then you'd have a hard time explaining what's real and what's not real in the book of Revelation. And if if chapter five isn't real, then that means heaven isn't real. That means if chapter 21 isn't real, that means the new Jerusalem isn't real. And so you have to look at this from the perspective that this is not written in code. It's not written in mystery. These are real events that the Bible is speaking of real events, real places, real experiences. And yes, it, there is symbol and figure and metaphor, 
But the symbols and the metaphors are prefiguring something very, very real. And so the way that we look at the book of Revelation is through that last one, the futurist. This is how we see it. This is how we interpret this book. We see it as events yet to come, that these are events still on the horizon for being done, that God is going to come. Christ will come in this way, and these events will happen shortly hereafter. Personally, I think there's value in all four of these ways of seeing the book of Revelation, the preterist, the historicist, the idealist, as well as the futurist. I think there's value in all of them. I think there's some truth to all of them. And I think that you can use all of these interpretive methods to reach a proper interpretation of the book itself. And so with that being said, let's take some time and read a few more of these verses. The Bible says in verse number three, it says, blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Now, this is the only book in the Bible that it tells you there is a special blessing in your life and mine for reading it. But not just reading it, it says, and keeping those things that are written therein. Keeping means holding them in your heart, holding them close to your heart. That there is a promise in this book that as you read it and cherish it, as you read it and obey it, as you read it and give, con- and give concentration to what it teaches, it ministers and says there's a blessing in store for those who read it. If you're not reading the book If you're not hearing the book being taught and listening to its words, you're missing its blessings. So here's the book. And what it says is to read it. So let's take our moment and let's read it. The book says in verse number four of John of Revelation one, it's a letter that John is writing to these seven churches, to these churches in Asia. It says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So John is saying that I'm writing this book, but it's not just me writing the book. It is written from him, look at the words, which is, which was, and which is to come. This one that is, was, and is to come. All three aspects of time. One man lives in all three aspects of time. Him that was, is, and is to come. Past, present, and future. The only one who is that is Jesus. He's Christ, as he goes on to explain. He says, and it's being written not only from Christ, the one who is, was, and is to come. The one who lives eternally. This is speaking of his eternality. Speaks of, his, uh, speaks of his deity, that he is the eternal Godhead, but not just from Christ, but also from the Holy Spirit. It says the seven spirits which are before his throne. Seven spirits, it doesn't mean that there are seven literal spirits. There's a, you know, spirit one, two, three, four, down to seven. It's not what it means. Seven is a biblical word that means perfection. Completion is a divine word that speaks of wholeness and being complete. You see that throughout the scriptures. And in the book of Revelation, there are seven sevens. Seven sevens. If you walk through the book, there's a seven spirits. There are the seven seals. There is a seven trumpets. There are the seven bowls. There are seven sevens. That the the book is replete with all of these sevens, these groupings of sevens. And then another uh, word, another number in the book of Revelation that's important is the number 12. The number 12, 144,000 are sealed. 12 times 12 is 144. Who are the 144? What is the meaning of 12? 12 apostles, 12 tribes. There's 24 elders, 12 and 12. So you see these 12s and you see these sevens. Seven means perfection, full, complete, perfect. Twelve is order, government, establishment, authority. 
right? And we'll get into this as we study these, these numbers. The seven here, seven spirits, is not seven different spirits, but it's seven perfect or the perfect spirit of God. It is incomplete and in totality. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse number one and verse two of Isaiah 11, it speaks about the seven manifestations of the spirit, spirit of peace, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of strength, the fear of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord. It speaks of these seven, seven attributes of the spirit. And what it's trying to communicate is that the spirit is whole and perfect and full, right? That the Holy Spirit has no error in him. He is perfect in knowledge, perfect in power, perfect in wisdom, perfect in counsel, perfect in strength. So it says that this book is given from a man who is eternal, who knows the past. He was. He knows the present and he knows the future. That's Christ. He's eternal. Nothing happens outside of his purview because he's in eternity looking down in time. But it's not just given from the man who is omniscient and omnipresent. He knows all things and is in all spaces. It is given from an ever powerful, all wise, all knowing spirit, the Holy Spirit, the perfect spirit, the seven spirits before the throne. And then it goes on and it says in verse five, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He just goes through this wonderful um, litany of praise and, and descriptions of Jesus Christ. It says he is the one who is the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, the faithful witness. He is the one who gets glory and dominion. This is the one who is writing the book from him who was, is, and is yet to come. The seven spirits before the throne and to him who is the faithful witness, the prince of all the kings of the earth and so on and so forth. And now this is who the book comes from, from the very hand and mouth of Jesus himself. Now this is who the book goes to. Notice it didn't say it just goes to believers and that would have been enough, but it calls us, look at the word in verse number six, and hath made us kings and priests unto God. Kings and priests. That's who you are. That's how God sees you. God sees you as a king or a queen and a priest or a priestess. Kings and queens, this is our authority in the earth. You were meant to have dominion over the earth. You were not meant to be under control. You were meant to be in control. You are meant to have dominion over the earth, dominion over your choices, dominion over your decisions, over your household, over your individual earth, a little kingdom in God's kingdom. You are a king, a queen. That's why your choices have power. That's why there's consequences to every decision, because we have power. It says life and death is in the power of your tongue. The Bible says that we are to pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, that bring your will on the earth, in my earth, in my experience, because you and I, we are kings and queens. But we're not just kings and queens in our authority, but we're also priests and priestesses. We have a relationship with God that is direct. The priesthood of every believer is what this is teaching, that if you're born again, you don't need a priest, you are a priest. You don't need someone pray for me. You can pray to God for yourself. When I pray for you, I am interceding for you in moments and seasons of your weakness, or I am joining my faith with your faith to strengthen our prayer before the Father. But you do not need me to stand in between you and God and for me to tell God about you and then you tell me and I'll tell 
God. You don't need that. You are a priest. You have a relationship with God. You know him directly for yourself. You have a personal experience with God and you need not that any man serve as your priest. This is how the book sees us. We're kings, queens, priests and priestesses. And then it says in verse number six. It says in verse six. And have made us kings and priests under God, his father, to him, the glory and dominion forever and ever. Verse seven. Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so. Amen. And then Jesus speaks and says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. Repeats what he said earlier. And then he calls himself the almighty. You have Christ using divine deity language because Christ and God are one. Now listen carefully. Look at this verse. It says, behold, he comes. He comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. Now, many have thought that this word, he comes with clouds. What could that mean? He's coming with clouds. Is he coming with literal clouds? And, you know, that means it's just a way to say he's coming out of the sky. Well, I think for our purposes, it's easy for us to say he's coming out of the sky. He's coming in the clouds. That's how Jesus describes the coming. This is how the angels at uh, the ascension in Acts chapter one, when Jesus ascended into heaven, when he ascended into heaven, the angel stood there in Acts chapter one. You remember, and the angel said the same way that you saw him ascend is the same way that he will descend when he comes back. And so those angels who standing there telling the disciples, why are you sitting here gazing up? The same Jesus who came is the same one who's coming back again the same way. So I do believe he is coming from the air, from the skies above us, just as he ascended. But I don't think that's what this means by coming with clouds, coming with clouds. Because if he had said, if that's what it meant, it wouldn't have said the word with. It would have used the word in. The Greek word there is en. The word dia is with the word en in Greek means he's coming in the clouds. That preposition is important. Coming in the clouds means that he is coming in clouds in the sky and we will see him. Or he would have said he's coming from the clouds, right? So coming from the clouds means he's coming from the sky. We would have seen him. Now, yes, I believe he is coming from the sky. Yes, I believe he is coming from the clouds in the clouds. Yes. But I don't think that's what this is trying to say. This uses a specific preposition with with this means that he's going to have clouds with him. There's two possible interpretations here about with one is hold your place in Revelations one and come with me to the book of Hebrews In the book of Hebrews, just a few books back. Book of Hebrews, chapter number 12, and you have seen this passage a thousand times before, right? Hebrews chapter 12, verse number one. Look at what it says. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about verse number one is not on the bottom of your screen. Hold your place in Revelation. Look at Hebrews 12 quickly. Wherefore, seeing we're also compassed about. Now, look at what it says with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us. The cloud of witnesses. These are other believers who have died and gone on before us. And these believers are called a cloud of witnesses. We know that when he comes, he's coming back with the saints. The Bible says he will return with the saints, right? So these saints, these believers is what the writer of Hebrews calls a cloud. He's coming not in, not from. He is coming in and from, but that's not what it's teaching in Revelation. He's coming with. This is every believer, Peter, James, John, Daniel, Abraham, Moses, every believer. It's going to be a massive reunion of the believers in heaven coming with him. Coming with him. 
the clouds coming with him. And every eye will see him. Every eye. So this is not a location. This is not he's coming from that way or that way or that space. Jesus said, if anybody tells you, here's the kingdom or there's the kingdom, believe it not, because the kingdom of God comes without a visible observation. Listen carefully. When he comes, he will cover the whole earth and every eye will see him because every eye will note the believers who have gone on before us. This great cloud of witnesses who are hovering and watching us right now. My grandmother watching us right now, your loved one watching us right now, along with saints of old watching us right now. And it's almost as if when he comes, he'll pull back the veil and he'll reveal the saints and he'll come with clouds. Now, there's one other meaning to this that I won't want you to capture. I don't want you to miss in Matthew chapter number 24. So hold your place in Revelation and come with me to the book of Matthew chapter 24 of the book of Matthew. And when you got it, say amen or type in an amen if you would. All right. And so it says here in this great Olivet Discourse, this great passage that speaks about um, about Jesus's return and what will happen whenever he comes back. And he says here in verse number thirty five, he says, heaven and earth shall pass away. It's on the bottom of your screen. You got to have your Bible in front of you. Matthew 24. Heaven and earth passes away. It says, but of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now look at what it says. For in the days, as in those days that were before the flood, before Noah's flood, it says they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Now listen carefully. So shall also the coming of of the son of man be. Now what happened when Noah went in the ark? What happened when Noah went in the ark? There was a flood. The flood came because of what? Because of rain or because of a storm. Not just a regular storm, but a storm so severe, it's so massive that it literally flooded the whole earth. The whole earth. Right? You have to have storm for that to happen. This is speaking of judgment. He says, the next time I come, I will not come by water. I will not come by flood. He says, it will be fire the next time. So the storm that's coming is a storm of fire, a storm of fire, not water, but fire. He says, and just as it was in Noah's day, so shall it be when the son of man, when Christ returns again, there will be another storm. But this time it will not be a water storm. It will be a fire storm. Now listen carefully. He's coming with clouds. You can't have a storm without clouds. Clouds, this darkening of the sky are the clouds. And John is saying that when he comes, he'll come with all of his saints. His saints will return with him. And when they come, they will come to vindicate the righteous, to expel wickedness and to overthrow the enemy. This is what it teaches in subsequent passages in Revelation 19, Revelation 20. It talks about the end of all things, the destruction of evil when Satan is defeated he's defeated because of a great battle the Lord and his saints will come to do battle against the enemy against Satan and his imps and we shall reign with him a thousand years and he shall reign forever and ever and ever this verse in Revelation chapter number one Verse seven is prefiguring how he will come. One, he will come back when you least expect it. Two, he will come back with clouds. All the saints that have gone before shall come back with him again. Three, he will come back to judge like a storm of fire. And that fire, Peter tells us, will be of such great heat 
that it will burn and destroy all the elements. Now, literal fire, figurative fire, I don't know, but here's what I do know, that the judgment that he will come back with will scorch just like fire. That's the clouds that he's coming with, not in, not from, but with those clouds. Ah. If I die before that day comes, I'm coming back with him in his army. If I die before that day comes, I come back with him in his army. That's what the church is. We are soldiers marching in the army of the Lord. We don't talk about that no more. Used to be a time in the old church when we sang that song, I'm a soldier, a soldier in the army of the Lord. We don't see a fight no more. There's no fight. We are in bed with the world. We agree with the world. There's no fight anymore. Nobody's fighting the enemy. But you better believe, you better believe everything about being a believer is to wrestle against spirits and powers and principalities and the rulers of the darkness of this age. Everything about being a believer. You are fighting for your faith. You're fighting for your family. You're fighting for your peace. You're fighting for your joy. You're fighting for righteousness. You are fighting for every single thing you get in the life you live as a Christian. And that fight will culminate. That fight will have a final end. And that final end is when we get the victory. This is why we, we, we celebrate. We celebrate our earthly victories. We claim the victory. We declare the victory. We declare that we are victorious over sin, victorious over Satan, victorious over his tricks, his schemes, his strategies, victorious over his hindrances. And why do we claim such? Why do we say that? Because our victory on the earth is a preview, a foreshadow of our ultimate victory in the heavens. In the heavens. Our victory on the earth foreshadows our victory in the heavens. And he wants you to get used to winning. He wants you to get used to victory. So the battles we go through now only prepare us for the great battle that is yet to come. And so back at Revelation chapter number one, in verse number seven, says he comes with clouds, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. It says everyone's going to see him, and they which pierced him. Some have said, well, that's the Pharisees, right? That's the Romans, right, who pierced him. Remember, remember, the Romans and the Pharisees they physically crucified Jesus. But you and I and our sins, it actually crucified Jesus. Your sin, my sin, is the sin that pierced him. We are the ones who pierced him. We are the ones who pierced him. You did, I did. The lie, the, the, the stealing, the, uh, the manipulation, the, uh, uh, the greed. All of that, the, the pride, the lust, that pierced him. He went to the cross to die for our sins. And the people who pierced him, me, you, we shall see him. Now, how are you going to see him? When you see him, in what state will you see him? Will you see him in peace? Or will you see him with a score still to settle? You see, I pierced him. I pierced him. I crucified him with my sin. So when I see him, I don't want him to hold that against me. I don't want him to come to me and exact his judgment on me, piercing him to that cross. I want to have that, listen, forgiven. I want it forgiven. I want to meet him in peace. So when I see him, I want to see him having Peace between me and him. And the only way that happens is if the blood of that cross cleanses me of my sin. If the blood of that cross washes me of my sins. And here's what it says. Here's the idea. As the blood of Jesus washes us of sin, he no longer sees us as the ones who pierced him, but he sees us as the sons and the daughters who love. And whom he loves. Look at what it says. It says in verse 
Number seven, every eye shall see him and they that pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. All kindreds of the earth, the people who have not been washed in his blood, who've not been cleansed by his power, who've not been cleansed by the cross, they wail, they weep because of the one that they see. Can you imagine what that will be? The day that he comes back and the atheist, the agnostic, the sinner, the cheat, the liar, the evil man, the hatred man, the ornery man, the man without Christ, who has been spitting in the face of Christ all of his life, who's been saying, there's no God all of his life, who's been saying, I dare God, or I dare God to get me, or God's never going to, who's been mocking God all of his life. Can you imagine what that man will say when he looks up and he sees the very Jesus that he has mocked? When he looks up and he sees the very Christ that he denied? That's what this is saying. And all the earth shall wail because of him. This is an I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. Interesting statement. I am Alpha and Omega. The first letter in the Greek alphabet, Omega, last letter in the Greek alphabet. I'm the beginning and the ending. What he's saying here is, I am the one who started it. I'm the beginning and I am the one who ends it. Alpha and Omega represents the entire Greek alphabet. No word in Greek could ever be written without that alphabet. Alpha, beta, gamma, all of those alphabets make up the words. Here's what Jesus is saying. There is no event, there's no circumstance, there's no situation in history or in life, there's no event in your life or mine that can happen without me being the author and the originator of it. I am alpha, I am omega. Any combination of letters you choose to make any word you choose to make, he says, I am that word. So if we're talking about peace, if we're talking about joy, if we're talking about power, if we're talking about grace, we're talking about glory, we're talking about anointing, we're talking about favor, we're talking about blessings or destiny or purpose or meaning to life, all of those words you need Jesus to make them real in your life. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's everything from A to Z. Then he says, I'm the beginning and the ending. He says, anything that happens in your life, good, bad, or indifferent, anything that happens in your life, I am the beginning of it. That's what Jesus says. I am upholding the whole world by, by my power and my strength. I am the beginning of it. I am the source of it. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thy own have we given to thee. He owns everything. He upholds the world with the word of his power. Listen carefully. He says, I am the beginning of everything you have ever experienced. And you know what? I'm going to be the end of it. I'm the ending. It finds its conclusion in me. You want it to stop, you want it to end, you're ready for it to, to, to let go, you want to be delivered from it. He says, I am the ending of it. It doesn't stop till I say. It doesn't end till I say, is what Jesus is saying here. I'm the beginning and I am the ending. Hallelujah. Say up the Lord, which is and which was, which is to come, the Almighty. Now, John says, in John chapter nine, John verse 9, I mean Revelation 1, 9, he says, I, John, talking here now about the writing itself and the location of that writing. He says, I am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. He says, I was in the isle called Patmos, Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm your brother and I'm your brother in tribulation. I'm your brother in persecution. And the church was going through great tribulation and great persecution at the time prefiguring the great tribulation that is yet to come upon the earth. And he says that I am your brother in struggle. I find this to be powerful to me. John is the beloved disciple. Remember that? He's the beloved disciple. He's the one who leaned on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. John is the one who Jesus said he'll tarry with this man until he returns, meaning he would be the oldest disciple to die. 
John says, even me, as loved as I am, as close as I am to Christ, even me, I go through tribulation and persecution right along with you. <laughs> if John went through it, don't you think you are going to go through it and I'm going to go through it? Look, guys, look, look. Paul, beheaded at Nero's chopping block, had his head cut off. Chains, severed, cut in half at Herod's delight. Peter, crucified upside down. Thomas, legend tells us, burned, no, boiled alive. Look at the martyrs and the saints torn asunder in gladiator games by wild animals, placed in barrels with nails in the barrels, locked in a big barrel with nails and spikes in the barrel and rolled down a hill. They died heinous deaths, critical deaths. One emperor, Nero, this emperor, he lit Christians on fire, doused them with oil, lit them on fire, put them on stakes, and lit up his gardens with human bodies. Persecution. The Bible says you have not yet striven under blood. It has not yet cost you your life. You have not yet been beaten and whipped and stripped because of your faith. The disciples were mocked and beaten, and they said we counted it a beautiful thing, an honor, to suffer reproach for the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at the early church. Look at how they suffered and how they bled. And we complain about a bill. We complain about a disappointment. We complain about a difficult time on a job. The persecution of the church makes our little stuff look like nothing. But if you are to be a believer, if you are to be a Christian, you will suffer persecution. Yes, you will. You will go through trial. You will go through tribulation. The Bible says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, be exceedingly glad. You've been counted worthy to suffer for the name and cause of Christ. This is what the believer is promised. Jesus said, in the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In John 16 and 33. The Bible teaches us, Jesus said in John chapter 17, the next chapter over, he says, if they hated me, you know they will hate you because you and I are one. If you're having a great season of your life right now, brace yourself. The enemy is around the corner waiting that he may rob you of that joy you're experiencing. If you're going through an easy sailing, smooth seas today, brace yourself because I promise you there is going to be a rough season and a rough patch just up the road. Brace yourself. Learn the value of prayer. Learn the value of being on your knees before God and having a relationship with him where you talk to him, where you pray, where you worship, where you spend time with him in the good times because you're building up the reservoir for when the bad times come. This is what John is saying. Listen carefully. John says that I am your companion in tribulation in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, who was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The island, the island of Patmos is a real place. This is a picture of Patmos that you're watching now on the screen. This is modern day Patmos. It is a real place. And that island, if you can see the blue water around that expanse of land, if you look, it's, it's nothing there. Even today, it's just a hill country. There's nothing there. And you can see over in the distance a little bit of land, a little bit of development over in the distance. But the much of it, the bulk of it is just rock, hill, and nothing is there. John was exiled in a prison on that island. It's the Alcatraz of the, of, the New, of the New Testament. It is the Robbins Island of South Africa that Nelson Mandela was in for 27 years of the New Testament. It is the Alcatraz, the prison. That's where John was. He was banished to that island called Patmos. And while he was there, he received the greatest revelation 
that any person has ever received as a prophet in the midst of his greatest tribulation. When God sends us to these islands, to our Patmoses, get ready for him to do and say something in your life that literally will redefine your whole experience with him. God speaks. Pastor Leslie Braxton preached a few weeks ago about I can see Jesus in the dark. Well, I want to tell you something else. You can hear Jesus in the dark. He speaks his clearest words in the darkest of nights on the Isle of Patmos. And here John says, while he was on that Isle called Patmos, John speaks to us and he says in chapter in verse 10, of this same chapter, chapter one, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. He says, I was in the spirit worshiping God on the Lord's day, on the day of worship. Some have said it's the day that Caesar was worshiped, Caesar as little Lord. But regardless of how you see it, John was in the spirit worshiping God. And while he's worshiping God, he heard a voice like a trumpet behind him. God interrupts the worship service to speak to John. And here's what Jesus says to him, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. He says, write what you see in a book and send it to these seven churches that are in what's called Asia Minor. And the image that you are seeing on your screen, this image is, if I can get to it, this image is the seven churches and where they're located. And I want you to look at this, these seven churches. It forms an arc. It forms a little arc, almost like an upside down Nike swoosh. It's almost like it's pointing to something that he sends them to the first church. And that first church is Ephesus and then the second and then the next and the next all the way down to the last church, which is Laodicea. And that last church of Laodicea represents the last age of the church, the last stage of the church. That when the letter gets to Ephesus, to Smyrna, and when it travels to Pergamos, when it travels all the way to Thyatira, when it travels to all the way uh, down to Philadelphia, the next stop it gets to is Laodicea. That is the last age of the church. When we get to that portion, you'll see that we are in the last church age. The last one. It is a lukewarm church. It is a church that's been diluted because of its favor and friendliness with the world. It is a church that has lost its first love like Ephesus. A church that literally makes Christ sick, where he spews it out of his mouth. And we'll talk more about it when we get there. Laodicea is the culmination of all the other atrocities in all the other churches. But it is also the culmination of all the other goodness and the commendations of all the other churches. That in one church, you have people that are red hot for Jesus and people that are ice cold for Jesus. When you blend them together, you have a lukewarm church. This is the last church age. And so it says in verse number 12, and this will not be on your screen. It says, and I turned to see the voice that spoke to me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. These seven golden candlesticks represent seven lights or perfect lights. It's, it is reminiscent of the Old Testament temple. In the Old Testament, there was the menorah or the candlestick, just one with seven candles on it. But this is seven candlesticks, seven menorahs all around, each one representing one of those churches. That God wants the church to have fire in it, fire for the heat of the church and light for the illumination of the church. When we come together, we need to be like a flame, guys, like a flame. We need to burn with fire, passion. 
and we need to learn in illumination and enlightenment. If you come to church and all you do is burn and you never learn, you didn't go to church. And if you go to church and all you do is learn and you never burned, you don't you don't know you haven't gone to church. What did Jesus say? What did the uh, the road, the men on the road to Emmaus say when they saw Jesus at the end uh, after his resurrection? They said, did not our hearts burn within us? That's the fire as he spoke with us. By the way, that's the light. Seven golden candlesticks representing each of those churches to have a flame and to have light burning and learning at the same time. And look at what it says. It says, and uh, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, verse 13 is not on the bottom of your screen. I apologize. You got to have your Bibles here, there, and we're going to stop in a minute. It says, and in the midst of those seven candlesticks, I saw one like unto the son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot and gird about the paps, that's his loin area, uh, with a golden girdle. Look at what it says. It says in the middle of the candlesticks, the candlesticks represent the church, the church, fire, burning and learning. Fire, the church, growth, the word of God, burning in my heart. The candlesticks are the church and the seven candlesticks form a circle, as it were, or a swoosh, as it were. And right in the middle of that swoosh or that circle is Christ, one like the son of man. Jesus is in the middle of the church. And that's what I want to tell you. Listen carefully. I don't care how many programs your church has. I don't care how good we do with community revitalization and development and our dream campaign and all we're doing for people that are hurting and all we do for people inside of our church and marriages and families and children and youth and big buildings and wonderful screens and lights and cameras. If Jesus is not in the center of our church, we do not have a church. The church is the church because Jesus is in the middle of it. That's why the church has the fire and the flame. And Jesus says in one of these churches, he says, if you don't repent, if you don't change your ways, I will come and I will extinguish your fire and take your candle out of its holder. And I will take away the light that is in your church because anything we do, in our church must center around Christ. And Christ is not just seen, but he's clothed in a garment down to the foot. This symbolizes righteousness. It's a common symbol in the Old and New Testament that the garments represent righteousness and also represents joy or praise. We have the garment of praise. This is the attributes of Christ that cover him that he is fully covered in his righteousness. It says all the way down to the foot and he's girt about uh, the loins with a golden girdle. This is this belt of truth that Paul speaks about, that Jesus has on a priestly garment. This is the girdle, the ephod, and it has the robe. It's a priestly garment. This is him standing in his priestly robe, serving as our advocate, as our intercessor, as our elder brother who goes between us and God, who intercedes on our behalf before the Father, that the king is also a priest. The king of kings is also the Lord of lords. All right. Wow. I got to stop. I don't want to, but our time is up. I got to stop. We're going to look next week at this picture of Jesus and what he has in his hands. And we're going to look at his feet and hear his voice. And we're going to see the response that John had when he saw him. He fell down as one that was dead. And when you really see Jesus, when you truly see Jesus, it takes your breath away. When you truly see Jesus, it knocks the wind out of you. You can't. Help but to bow in worship when you really see Jesus. You can't help but to honor and adore him when you really see him. He says, I dropped as one that's dead. What strength do I have when I've seen him? 
What arguments can I give when I've seen him? What glory do I have when I've seen Jesus? When I've seen Jesus, I've seen the full end of my life, the whole point of my living, the full meaning of why I'm alive. It's all because of him. Do you know Jesus that way? Do you know him that way? Not the nice figure on the cross, not the shiny thing you wear around your neck, not the pretty hymns we sing in church. Do you know Jesus that way? Did he save you? Did he truly give you victory? Has he truly changed your life? Are you genuinely born again? Do you know Jesus that way? Does the thought of him take your breath away? Does the mention of his name fill your heart with wonder? Do you know him that way? Many people don't, but many people do. And if you know him that way, worshiping him is easy. Honoring him with your life is a responsibility. It's an automatic thing to give him my life because he is the author and the finisher of my life. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the A all the way to Z. Everything about me centers around him. And that's what this first chapter is trying to get us to see is a clear picture of Jesus. So next week, we'll talk a little bit about that picture and what it looks like. And we'll introduce the concept of these, uh, these churches, and then we'll spend our time digging into the seven churches and looking at that first one the Church of Ephesus. It's going to be a great study. Thank you for spending this time with us. I pray that you are seeing clear, that you're not running from this book, but you're running towards it. Oh, what a blessing it has in it. Here's what it says. Blessed is he that reads and hears the words of this prophecy and keeps them close to his heart. That's our prayer for you. All right. All right. Thank you so much for being here with us. Some of the folks that are on our stream here. Just want to give a big thank you to many of you for sharing. Thank you so much. Rebecca War. So much. Thank you. Uh, Juana Britt and Shakita Francis. Thank you, Sharon Brown. Faith. Hey, Faith Danzy. Thank you so much for being on this stream with us. Uh, today, Tawanda Moore, thank you so much for being with us on the stream. How we give God praise for you. Seif uh, Keith, I think I'm saying that word right, that name right. Thank you for being with us. James, thank you so much for being with us on the stream today. We're just grateful to God for Domo, for being here, for the Mann family, amen, for being here with us. Dana and Paul, for Terrell, thank you, and for Debbie Cameron, thank you. Debbie is normally on a camera or in the media room on Wednesdays, but tonight she's in Bible studies and getting a chance to take a break. Sister Pat Rucker, bless you, Sister Pat. God bless all of you. Effie and uh, Belinda, thank you so much. Lisa, thank you for being a part of our time together tonight. What a great, great time we've had studying the Word of God together as a family. Father, I thank you for every experience we have in our life. That, Lord, who we are is because of who you are. What we know is because of what you've shared with us. Make us ready for that day. Make us ready for that day when you come back to get your bride. Make us ready for that day. Let there be no unfinished business. Let there be no unturned stones. Make us ready, God. I pray that you will prepare us for the fight ahead. When the enemy comes in like a flood, prepare us. Help us taste victory here on the earth so we'll know what it tastes like in glory. Let it be, God, that we see you for who you are in the middle of our life, controlling our destinies. And we'll give your name praise. We love you. We honor you. We worship you. For there's none like you in all the earth. Be pleased with our life in Jesus' name. Amen. 
and they met again. Amen. I love you guys so much. Thank you for hanging with us tonight and being a part of our study. Our time is up, but we pray that you'll be with us on Sunday. Don't miss this coming Sunday. It's going to be great. It's going to be a great time of practical teaching this Sunday, talking about family and marriage. This is us. We're going to be studying it again. Please make certain that you're present and don't miss next week as we dig deeper into the book of Revelation. I love you much. I'll see you on Sunday. God bless. Take care.